Hi, my name is Max Bernstein, and I'll be presenting on Medicine et al.'s on detecting adversarial perturbations. So first, some background and motivation behind this paper. As we've learned in class, a continued issue in machine learning is the detection of small, carefully directed perturbations. Uh, these adversaries, which are oftentimes quasi-imperceptible to the human eye, can lead to incorrect classification with high confidence on artificial systems. A classic example of this would be an image of a human skier, which when changed and perturbed, uh, it's pixels in such a way that is unperceivable to the human eye, yet when put through a classifier, it is classified as a dog. This uh, field is especially important for the deep learning methods in, the sa in safety and security applications in such a way where such adversaries can prevent such methods from being used. The authors note that no such effective countermeasures have uh, yet been implemented or known, and that is the motivation that they have going to this paper. So the goals for this paper are primarily to develop a binary detector network, which is built of a classification and adversarial networks. This dual network would be able to discriminate between samples from the original data and the adversarial examples. They also want to train this detector so that it can be hardened against sophisticated attacks that take into account both the adversarial and classifier networks. So first, some data set and formalizations. Um, classically, like, we will be using the standard input of X as an input image and Y true of X as the hot one hot coding of a true class image X. At the same time, they have this function J classifier fire of X Y sub X, which is the cost function of the classifier. We'll be using these general these formalizations in the building of our adversarial examples in three ways: the fast method, the basic iterative method, and the deep full method. These adversarial examples that we will build, that they built, are then used in experiments later on. We will first talk about the FAST method for generating adversarial examples first described by Goodfellow et al. in 2015. The general idea here is to apply perturbations in the direction of uh, an image space which yields the highest increase of linearized cost under the L infinity norm. This is achieved by performing one step in the direction of the gradient, gradient sign with the step width epsilon. This can be seen in the formula presented on the slide, where x adversarial is equal to the x input of the epsilon sign of the gradient with respect to x times the cost of the classifier, where epsilon is the hyperparameter for the distance between the adversarial and the original image. This is often called the FAST method because it is non-iterative, hence the FAST uh, computational speed. We'll also talk about the basic iterative method. First described by uh, Couric and et al. in 2016, what they did was apply the FAST method several times with a smaller step size. Uh, at the same time, they also uh, clipped all the pixels after each iteration to ensure you stay in the epsilon neighborhood of the original image. You can see this here in the form presented on the slide, where x adversarial is equal to the clip of the x adversarial plus the alpha sign of the gradient times the cost function, where alpha sign is the step size. In their paper, Kurikan et al. used an alpha equal to one. At the same time, the authors of this paper uh, proposed a variation on the basic iterative method, what they call the L2 norm-based method. What you do here is in each step, you move uh, each step of the method moves in the direction of the normalized gradient. This is also projected uh, adversarials back onto the epsilon ball around x if L2 distance is greater than epsilon. The adversarials are pointed with L2 distance from epsilon to X. You can see this here in the, uh, the form presented in which X adversarial is equal to the project 
method of the x over 0 plus the alpha times normalized gradient. We'll also talk about the deep fool method. Um, I won't go too in the depth into the deep fool method as the authors essentially just took the work of Wasabi uh, does fully at all and applied it to their paper. However, I must touch on it as it is an important part of their work that they did later. The basic idea of uh, the deep fool method is to iteratively perturb an image and each step the classifier is linearized around that image to determine the closest class boundary. Uh, the minimal step according to the LP distance from the image to traverse the class boundary is then determined and this is the point that is used as the next adversarial example. The algorithm eventually stops when the next adversarial example changes the class of the actual classifier. So as we have uh, described ways of generating adversarial examples, we also have to have ways of detecting them. So the authors here did this using their adversary detection network. This detector is basically a branch of the main network at some layer, and it produces uh, an output P adversarial. This P adversarial is the probability of an input being an adversary. This detector is trained to classify network inputs into being regular examples, specific adversary generated examples. So the basic process uh, used here is first, the classification network is trained on non-adversarial data. Um, then the adversarial examples are generated using one of the methods discussed previously. Uh, for each data point of the training set. Uh, what is output is a balanced binary classification data set of twice the size of the original data set. This consists of the original data and corresponding uh, adversarial examples. Here, the weights of the classification network are essentially frozen and the detector can then be trained using the combined data set of both the non-adversarial and adversarial data uh, to minimize the cross entropy between the P adversarial and the labels. So here is an image of the detector uh, classifier network. Um, it is a 32 layer ResNet. Uh, in the image you can see on top of the arrows are the number of feature maps for the layer and then the errors below are the spatial resolutions. To the bottom is the adversarial detector. Uh, this is a convolutional uh, neural network using batch normalization and rectified linear units. It is attached at one of the positions uh, ADI, as you can see either uh, between each of the layer. Um, this classif classifier detector network in each experiment was trained for 100 ep uh, epochs and uh, with stochastic gradient descent. And after each epoch, the network's performance uh, was, was taken on the validation that data. Um, the network was with the maximal performance was then used for subsequent experiments. So as mentioned earlier, the authors we're not only interested in uh, studying detecting adversaries, but also detecting uh, adversaries that are dynamic and that they might have access to not only the classification network and its gradient, but also the detector in its gradient. These adversaries might be able to generate inputs to the network that fool both the classifier and the detector. So in order to uh, create these adversaries, the authors did a variation on the basic iterative method described previously, in which we are replacing um, the alpha sign, alpha sign of the gradient times the cost function with this new term, dictated by a new term, sigma. As we can see in the form I presented, the x adversarial is equal to the clip of 
the x adversarial plus alpha one minus the sigma times the uh, j classifier of x y uh, sub true of x of sigma times j detector of x one, where j detector of x one is the cost of the te te of the detector generated x and the label being an adversary, and also so the sigma here is hyperparameter. So essentially what's going on is the adversary is maximizing its cost um, with the aim of letting the classifier mislabel the input x while making the detector's output p adversarial as small as possible. This adversary can adapt uh, to the detector. So while they're uh, making these dynamic adversaries, they also have to detect them. And they did, the, they did so using what they call the uh, dynamic adversary training. What they essentially did was compute adversary examples on the fly for each batch of the experiment. And they allowed the dynamic adversary to modify each data point by randomly selecting a parameter sigma. This uh, created adversary data points they used for training. Uh, which they were able to do implicitly, implicitly train the classifier to resist the dynamic adversaries for these various uh, values of sigma. So some ex experimental setup. They performed these experiments primarily on the CIFAR-10 data set uh, against both static adversaries and the dynamic adversaries previously discussed. Um, so first, on the static adversaries, these were the ones uh, that only have access to the classification network, and they found that the detector performed best when attached to 82 and 84 positions. They also performed these CIFAR-10 uh, data set experiments using dynamic adversaries. Once again, and these were the adversaries that have access to both the classifier network and the adversarial detector network. And similar to the static adversaries, they found that the detector performed best at the 82 and 84 positions. At the same time, the authors performed experiments on the 10 class ImageNet. Um, the motivation behind this was to investigate whether adversarial perturbations can be detected at higher resolutions images and for other networks uh, no, network architectures rather than the ResNet that they had chosen. So the data set uh, they used was then was a, subnet, a subset of the ImageNet consisting of data from 10 randomly selected classes. They performed the experiments using this data set using set, static uh, adversaries as described earlier and found that the detector formed best on this data set after or when it was attached to after the fourth max pooling layer. So some experimental results. We'll start first with the static adversaries from the CIFAR-10 data set experiments. Uh, the left graph compares the detectability of different adversaries. Um, the x-axis is the predictive accuracy of the CIFAR-10 classifier on adversary, adversarial examples for different adversaries, whereas the y-axis is the corresponding detectability for adversarial examples, where 0 0.5 is the chance level. Uh, the class no, denoted by the right ways facing blue or turquoise triangle, is an adversary that left the input unchanged. In general, from these results, or from this graph, we can say that the points in the lower left of the plot correspond to stronger adversaries. This is because their adversarial examples are harder to detect and at the same time fool the classifier on most of the image. So the results indicate that detectability is greater than 80% for all adversaries, uh, which decrease classification below 30%. At the same time, adversaries great greater than 90% detectable when classification accuracy is less than 10%. Uh, we can say that the fast adversary, denoted by a blue circle, 
can generally be considered a weak adversary, whereas the deep fool, um, per, uh, denoted by the green diamond, can generally be considered a strong adversary, whereas the iterative is somewhere in the middle. In general, the L2 norm-based adversaries perform stronger than the L infinity-based adversaries. To the right, uh, the graph compares the detectability of different adversaries on detectors attached at different points of the classification network. Um, from the results, we can see that the fast and iterative methods perform best when attached to the 82 position, while the deep fool uh, method perform best when attached to the AD4 position. So some more results for the static adversaries. Uh, to the left, there are three graphs which represent the generalizability of trained detectors with different choices of epsilon. Detectors trained on large epsilon uh, tend to not generalize well to uh, small epsilon uh, examples, whereas detectors trained on small epsilon work pretty well for uh, large epsilon examples. Um, on the right-hand side, we have a graph that represents the generalizability of the detectors trained on one adversary when tested on a data from other adversaries. The results indicate that detectors generalize well between L the L infinity and the L2 norm-based variants of the same approach. Also, detectors trained on strong iterative adversaries generalize well to fast adversaries, but not the other way around. Also, detectors trained on iterative adversaries generalize well to deep fool adversaries, but not the other way around. So moving on to dynamic adversaries and the results from those experiments, the graph uh, presented on the slide uh, indicate the results of dynamic adversaries with epsilon equal to one against a static detector and dynamic detector. As can see, be seen by the results, the static detector did not perform that well and is not robust against dynamic adversaries for certain sigma values. At the same time, the detectability is close to the chance levels and the predicted performance is greatly reduced to less than 30% accuracy. On the other hand, the dynamic detector is much more robust and robust and compared to the static detector. The on the whole, the detectability is more than 70% for all instances of sigma. Next, we'll move on to the 10 class image net. The image presented compares the detectability of static adversaries. Um, as can be seen by the results, all adversaries fail to decrease predictive accuracy of the classifier below a chance of 0 0.1. Um, the detectability is greater than or equal to 85% for all of the methods except for the L2 method. On the whole, the authors considered this experiment a success, noting that the failure case of the L2 iterative method emphasizes that the detector must be able to detect very subtle patterns um, and the optimizer might get stuck in a bad lo local optima or plateau. So some more graphs similar to what we saw in the CIFAR 10 data set, but for the 10 class ImageNet. To the left, we once again see the transferability of the detector between different values of epsilon. Uh, as we can see, the results are essentially analogous, analogous to the CIFAR 10 classifier. Uh, detectors trained for an adversary for a small value epsilon worked well for the same adversary with larger epsilon, but not the other way around. To the right, we see a transferability between adversaries. Um, the results indicate that transferring detector between two adversaries works relatively well. And detectors trained on deep fool adversaries work well on all other adversaries. Um, this indicates that transferability is not necessarily symmetric. It tends to work well between similar adversaries and from strong adversaries 
to weaker adversaries. The authors conclude by proving empirically that adversarial examples can be detected well using a detector subnetwork attached to a main classification network. They hypothesize that this might be because there are areas which are adversarial to both the classifier and the detector. So while their classification network does not directly allow classifying adversarial examples correctly all the time, it allows the mitigation of adversarial attacks against machine learning systems by resorting to fallback solutions. This is ultimately important in the mitigation of adversarial attacks on machine learning systems.